All right. Good evening, everybody. We will call the Belvedere City Council Committee of the Whole of April 24, 2023 to order. If the clerk will help me with the roll call, please. Brereton? Here. Flurry? Here. Frank? Frank is absent. Freeman? Here. McGee? Here. Mulhall? Mulhall is absent. Porter? Here. Prather? Prather is absent. Snow? Here. Stevens? Here. Five present. Oh, sorry, seven present. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I don't believe we have anybody registered for public we comment. Do not. Uh, we do not have a public forum, the forum this evening. Uh, reports of officers, boards, and special committees. Item one, public safety unfinished, unfinished business. We have none. Uh, item two, public safety new business. Uh, a police department update. Chief Woody. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening. Uh, so since uh, last month's update, the uh, Fire and Police Commission met on April 13th. They appointed uh, three new recruits to the Belvedere Police Department. Uh, Carlos Ochoa, Gerardo Venegas, and Evan Bendel. Uh, they uh, replaced Officers Barillo, Deputy Chief Gardner, and Officer Moore. Uh, that uh, at that point uh, we have uh, exhausted our list of 10 entry level candidates and we'll be testing again June 24th at the Belvedere High School. Uh, we will, the Belvedere Police Department will be conducting a swearing in at the community building on April 27th at 10 a.m. Uh, there uh, we will be swearing in th uh, the three new recruits. We'll be promoting uh, Detective King to Sergeant and appointing Sergeant Smaha to Deputy Chief. Uh, Detective King uh, has been rotated from detec detectives back to patrol and is currently being mentored by Sergeant Ball in preparation for his promotion. Uh, Sergeant Ball will be replacing Sergeant Smaha as the detective sergeant on May 4th. Uh, K-9 officer Rich Zaff has been assigned to detectives. Officer Matt Korn has been assigned to be the next K-9 and is currently in week two of a six-week canine handler training. Sergeant Bird uh, will be graduating from Northwestern School of Police, Staff, and Command, and Jonathan Hernandez, uh, entry-level candidate, uh, recruit, uh, will be graduating from the Suburban Law Enforcement Academy uh, on April 28th. The tuition for Sergeant Byrd to attend Staff and Command was covered by the Illinois Association uh, Chiefs of Police at a savings uh, to the city of uh, $4,400. And uh, uh, the 2022 annual report for the Police Department is uh, currently on Facebook and the city's website for uh, uh, you to view if uh, you so choose. Uh, that uh, concludes my report and I will answer any questions that you may have. All right. Thank you, Chief. Any questions? Alderwoman Freeman. Thank you, Mayor. So we're not going to get a, a, a hard copy of that like we usually do? I can actually absolutely uh, print that out if you'd like. Absolutely. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. And uh, we'll move. Thank you, Chief. We'll move to item B. Uh, also, ordinance authorizing the sale of squad cars, Chief Woody. Thank you again, Mayor. Uh, Mr. Mayor, City Council, before you is an ordinance requesting to sell surplus uh, police department vehicles. Uh, these vehicles have no operational values, currently utilizing valuable storage space. Uh, the first vehicle is a 2008 Dodge Durango with 190,000 miles. Uh, which uh, has an undercarriage which is rusted through. A 2016 Kia Sorento, which has a uh, cracked engine block, according to Kunis, would cost us uh, approximately $11,000 to fix. Uh, Kelly Blue Book uh, estimates its um, uh, value ranging from $10,300 to $12,300. Uh, 
Number three, a 2004 Dodge Intrepid, uh, an old uh, volunteers and policing vehicle, which won't start uh, without mechanical work. A 2009 Dodge Charger, also another volunteers and policing uh, vehicle, which won't start without mechanical work. A 2006 Cherokee TT, which is an old FEMA trailer that's uh, been gutted. And a 2016 Dodge Charger with 87,600 uh, actual miles, 12,000 engine hours, which uh, equates to approximately 360,000 uh, engine miles, which also uh, has had uh, approximately $9,500 in maintenance uh, over its lifetime. And uh, uh, one of the vehicles that we've been uh, experiencing to uh, have uh, uh, engine block problems, which we've had to replace uh, multiple of uh, within uh, that year of uh, squad car. I would request a motion to authorize the mayor or his designee <coughs> to sell the vehicles identified in Exhibit A by any means authorized by state statute, including but not limited to an internet auction site, other auction methods, or trade in for new vehicles. All righty. Could I get a motion to that effect? Motion by Alderman Porter, second by Alderman Flurry. Uh, any questions for Chief Woody regarding the six vehicles that will be um, auctioned off? Alderwoman Freeman. Thank you. So, Chief, do you have a, a rough ballpark, maybe, estimate of the collective value of all of these? No, not at this point. Uh, it would be our intention. Uh, Kunis has offered to uh, take these vehicles to auction for us. And uh, until we get uh, them to auction, uh, there, there's really no uh, value. It's a matter of what somebody's willing to pay for it. Uh, I can tell you that a majority of these vehicles uh, aren't going to uh, hold much value at all. All right, any other questions for Chief Woody? All right, then uh, we have a motion and a second on the floor uh, for the six vehicles, as the Chief had mentioned. On the very back page are the associated VIN numbers that go with them. And um, this will come back in ordinance form then. Uh, hearing no other questions, all those in favor of the motion on the floor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. If there's any opposed. All right. Motion passed. Thank you. And item C uh, as well, Chief Woody, regarding Police Department vacation time carryover for yours. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I would request uh, uh, vacation carryover for the uh, three following individuals, Detective Casey Brox, Sergeant David Bird, and Officer Jonathan Hernandez. Uh, Detective Brox is on medical leave, which will continue through fiscal year, uh, fiscal year 23 uh, on April 30th, 2023. Uh, she currently has 19 hours of remaining vacation time. Uh, I'm requesting that this balance be carried over into fiscal year 24 due to her medical leave, which prevents her from using these hours. Sergeant David Bird uh, attended the Northwestern University School of Police Staff and Command from February 6th to April 28th, 2023. Due to his required uh, attendance at the training, he was unable to use 37.25 hours of remaining vacation time, requesting that these hours be carried over into fiscal year 24. And Officer Jonathan Hernandez, uh, who was hired on January 6, 2023, has been attending basic law enforcement training at the Suburban Law Enforcement Academy from January 9th to April 28, 2023. Due to his required attendance, uh, he has not been able to use the 24 hours of accumulated holiday time. I'm requesting the hours be carried over into fiscal year 24. I would request a motion to authorize the carryover of unused uh, vacation slash holiday time in fiscal year 23 to fiscal year 24 as shown below. Thank you, Chief. Could I get a motion to that effect? Motion by Alderman Snow, second by Alderman Porter. Any discussion regarding the motion on the floor? Alderman Snow? Curiosity, do they make the request through you um, that they want the carryover as opposed to just being paid out? Yes, uh, historically they uh, make the request, uh, we submit it to the council, and um, by contract, if the council denies that, then uh, they're required to get that paid at overtime. Okay, thank you. Any other questions regarding the motion on the floor? All right, hearing none, uh, all those in favor of the motion on the floor then, uh, will signify by saying aye. 
Aye. Aye. If there's any opposed, okay, motion passed. Thank you. And moving on to item 2D on the next page, uh, Fire Department update, Chief Shadle. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you, Your Honor. Over the last 30 days, the Fire Department has responded to 271 calls, an average of about nine per shift. Included in those calls are five building fires. Those were all aid, where we aided other departments to their fires. We had a carbon monoxide incident. We had, uh, g did give CPR one time. 175 EMS calls, four natural gas leaks, seven car accidents with injuries, eight car accidents without injuries, four power lines down, totaling in addition to other incident types, 271 calls. Uh, aid given and aid received. We gave aid those five times for those structure fires, and we received aid seven times. The aid given, we gave aid to District 3 for a fire, District 2, two fires, Rockton, a fire, and Marengo for a fire. The aid received, Six times we received aid from District 3 for an ambulance. And the last aid received, of course, was the Apollo collapse. For that response, there was 15 fire departments, two EMS agencies, two police agencies, public works, three dispatch centers, two utility companies, one medical doctor, and two support agencies. On April 6th, after the incident, we did host a critical incident stress management meeting for the individuals. Anytime individuals have a, we have a critical incident, so we have a policy what is a critical incident and what's not. Um, Apollo obviously qualified, um, basically really bad calls, like the death of a child or someone you know or multiple casualties, things like that. We have these, we have an outside agency come in, uh, the Illinois Firefighters Peer Support Group, and they come in and they have trained professionals to lead these discussions. So on April 6th, we had that at our station. There was 25 in attendance. It was, um, the invite went out to everybody that was right there, hands-on people, first in, and um, it was mostly comprised of firefighters, EMTs, and uh, one, a dispatcher. So last month's training, we actually started uh, the Kelly houses that you guys approved that acquired structure training agreement. Uh, so far they've done vent, vent under isolate search training and vertical ventilation training. Last month we did electrical vehicle extrication training, radiation monitoring, and we did familiarization and pre-planning of the courthouse and jail and then Franklin display, display. For EMS, we trained on advanced airways. And then also on March 4th, we happened to do a walkthrough of the Apollo uh, we did that walkthrough, and then we actually went through at 7 p.m. that night because they had an event every once in a while when they have a large event. We'll do a walkthrough, and we'll make sure that the egress is maintained and all the uh, exits aren't blocked and things like that. So we, we did that on March 4th. So on a positive note, you guys have the handout from Captain Cunningham. The first event is the fire department hosted event at the fire station. Uh, from noon to two on June 2nd. And the other one, uh, Chad is throwing himself a big party. So, and you guys are all invited. <laughs> all right, so upcoming, obviously, next week, next Monday, we're providing the ambulance service. So there's been a lot of work. There's still a little bit of work to do. Uh, we're working on that, and we will be providing the service on May 1. Also that first week of May, our new engine should arrive. 
So it should arrive, I would expect, about 30 days to actually in-service, decal, um, get it all equipped before it is front line, but it's coming soon. So that concludes my report. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Chief Shadel? All right. All right, thank you, Chief. And then item E uh, is also fire department issue, uh, authorization to hire a fire inspector. Uh, Chief Shadel. Yes, sir. Thank you, guys. So this is an item that was budgeted for, and we did briefly discuss it during the budget preview night. So essentially, there's three things that I, I knew right away that, as fire chief, that I felt we needed to put into place to make sure that we're able to provide, carry out our mission and provide excellent service. So the first one was the uh, engine, and that's coming. The second was we had to change over our RMS, our re records management software, which is quite a, quite a process, but we um, got that taken care of. And uh, now is the time that I am requesting a full-time inspector. So in your handout with that memo, if you'll look at the next page, you'll see that there's roughly 628 buildings that it would be nice if we were able to walk through on a somewhat frequent basis. Right now we're handling our inspections by the full-time firefighters. They do them on duty. They do them on overtime when they're off shift. There's four inspectors in the department, and they, they are doing a good job. They, do, they prioritize the highest priority. Um, right now, the highest priority is anything brand new that comes in. It has to be reviewed for their sprinkler systems, their fire protection systems. So obviously, we don't want to delay any construction in the city, so those are priority. And then target hazards, and then things that come up um, by request and things like that. But you'll see in the future pages, if you skip past that, to the first graph is compliant versus deficient systems. You'll see a number of systems that are, are deficient. Currently, we don't have the manpower to follow up on those. If you'll skip that, well, that next one is deficient systems by type for your information. And the next one is current versus past due systems. So unfortunately what's happening is these past due systems, we utilize the Briar, uh, Bricer compliance engine. They send notice out to the uh, businesses and say, hey, these are the fire protection systems you have on file. Have your alarm company or whoever's inspect these send paperwork that you've completed that. Since we're unable to follow up on these, the number of past dues has been inching higher and higher and higher, and I suspect until we have someone that can uh, inspect these buildings on an annual basis, all, all 628 of them, I think this will be the case. And so uh, that is definitely will be priority one for this new full-time inspector. And then if you skip past that next graph, you'll see a draft job description for this individual. And uh, it would be a 40-hour individual be a non-sworn full-time fire inspector and with your permission I would request the following motion motion to authorize the city to hire one full-time non-sworn fire department inspector and I'll be happy to answer any questions okay I'll Thank make that motion your honor motion by <coughs> Alderman Stevens second by Alderman Fleury and if there's any questions uh, for Chief Shadle, uh, Alderman Porter. Uh, just one, Chief. I was curious here, the uh, salary range, 56365 How does that compare to other um, municipalities, uh, about the same? So we do have a, a study, and it's, it's not in this. I can provide it for you. Captain Laterno is our inspection coordinator. He was kind enough to provide all this information. 
I think it's a reasonable request. It kind of depends on the setup. So there are a few area departments where the inspector is a chief, like in Cherry Valley. So he's a deputy chief, and that's his role of inspections. Obviously, salary is quite a bit higher than that. And then in, in Rockford, it's a promoted position at Rockford Fire. So again, it would be um, higher salary than that. I know for uh, one department that contracts that individual out, the total cost for that contract is about 90000 uh, but that also includes benefits and things like that. Um, there's other departments that do it on overtime, like ours, or they have FLSA 7G exceptions, Attorney Drella, is that what it is? 7G. So <laughs> I believe it's a FLSA, FSLA exemption 7G, which basically says if a firefighter is working on an alternate duty, you can negotiate the wage for that, and then it would just be hours paid at that wage. That salary happens to be the starting firefighter salary. That's just what we landed on, and we will we'll test the market. Obviously, if we can't find anybody at, at that salary, then we'll have to explore our options at that time. But I'm hoping that with that salary plus the competitive benefits package offered to city employees, I think it's a, a good fair deal for somebody. Alderman Fleury. Thank you. So if we hire this person, so you said right now there's currently four firefighters that are authorized to do inspections. Will they continue doing inspections along with this one to try to bring that down? Yes, absolutely. Um, I've communicated to them as well that this isn't an attempt to replace what they do. Um, there is quite a few advantages to having uh, the on-duty firemen do those, knowing the buildings, bringing that information in-house and, um, you know, responding and, and all that being tied together. And also, there's just going to be more work than this individual can do, so those four will still be primarily working on new construction and kind of the things they were doing where this uh, full-time employee would be focused really on these annual walkthroughs, annual pre-plan updates, and all, all this, the try and get caught up with this, these annual tasks. So they will still continue to be inspectors. They'll still um, do what they do on duty and, and off duty. Uh, in addition to what they do, this individual would do these tasks. Okay, thank you. Alderwoman Freeman. Thank you again, Mayor. So, um, Chief, I have two things. So this is a um, non-sworn city salaried employee, so not a union member. That's correct. He, he wouldn't be a, a sworn firefighter, but... Uh, on the other hand, he would be not doing, or we wouldn't request him to do any firefighter duties. He won't have turnout gear. He won't have SCBA radios, well, potentially a radio. But um, those, uh, it's a completely different line of work than the current uh, union firefighters are doing. Um, the union inspectors realize the gap. They realize they can't do all this and um, they're very supportive of this. It's something that I've communicated with them all the way through and um, they are in person to me uh, very supportive of the idea. Continue. Thank you. And then um, I know it's been a struggle for us to keep up on these inspections for a long time now. Um, but. It says the candidate will work under the supervision direction of the fire department inspections coordinator, which would be Captain Letourneau. So he will be the one that does the interviews and, and actual hiring process? Yeah, it would, Captain Letourneau and myself would primarily be um, making, doing the interviews and seeing what type of response we have, but yes. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for... Chief Shadle.
Okay, I know when uh, Chief and I had a discussion about this, uh, one of my concerns was what um, was already voiced here this evening about, um, you know, um, collective bargaining and what have you. And uh, the Chief has uh, answered that. He's assured me that uh, that isn't an issue, and I appreciate that. Uh, he's conveyed that here this evening. And then also, um, you know, we have 289 inspections that are past due and we have not been able to make, make up ground with them. Um, Chief, would you comment on some of the risks that are involved um, by not being able to address these uh, and le or letting them go? I think that's important. Sure. So basically, if something is delinquent, we have no idea if the fire protection systems that are required by code and in place because of code are working. So that could be emergency lighting, sprinkler test, um, fire pumps, things like that. It could be could be a large corporation with a lot of employees. It could be you know a building with with five employees that their alarm system wasn't checked, but. All those codes in the IFC 2015, almost every single code that was written there is because something, something bad happened. And they're like, well, let's try and do better next time. So those would be the types of things that would potentially, and then going back to the deficiencies, those deficiencies are actual systems that they did submit the information, but on when it was tested, it was deficient so those were actually not working so you have those that aren't working and then you have the ones that you don't know about so those are the the differences there and then the in-person inspection also quickly identifies common hazards that you can't just get from knowing that the systems are working for example, we've gone on fire calls and had to reset the alarm panel, and um, lo and behold, the entire exit is filled up with crates of Gatorade, and we gotta move like a pallet of a Gatorade to get, even get to the panel to shut it off, and then that emergency exit's completely blocked. So any modifications, alterations to the building, if we're not stepping foot in those buildings, um, we won't know that. A lot of times for the building department, those inspections are triggered when they request a permit, right? But they do, it's, the assumption is is that they're keeping everything else in line. So it, unless you have someone that's physically going in, following up and saying, hey, we notice that you have some deficiencies, are they corrected? Oh, great, or if not, well, let's, this, let me educate you on how you can correct them. And then, or the next ones, that uh, second graph, um, you haven't submitted your paperwork, now we're going to need it submitted by, you know, a reasonable time frame, and then so correcting those. And then once they're submitted and deficiency, so there's a whole, each one of these could be multiple follow-ups. And so as you can see, um, one full-time individual will slowly chop this big tree down over time but that would be the intent. Thank you, Chief. Any other questions uh, for Chief Shadle? Alderman Freeman. Thank you. Um, one more, Chief. So if your inspector goes into a building and finds that there's chemicals in that building that you didn't know were there or they're not stored properly or there's other hazards going on, what happens? They get a ticket. They'd get um, time to to fix that, remedy it. So obviously, there's certain levels of deficiencies. There's if it's a life safety code, like an immediate life hazard. There's times that it has to be fixed while you're while you're there. If it's a uh, blocked means of egress, you know they will be okay. We will fix this right now. Um, you know, if the every company has to submit by law tier two reports which state any hazardous materials that they have. And so, you know, if, if that changed, that there would have to be some sort of process, a reasonable process to, to go in. Obviously, um, we work for 
the community and we also work for those business owners, right? Like we work for them, so our number one goal is to help them into c compliance with uh, reasonable or sometimes the less, the least expensive way to become compliant and so exploring those options. So it would definitely be a case by case situation, but if there's an immediate life threat, then we would not leave until it was corrected. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Chief Shale? All right, uh, hearing none, the motion on the floor in the, then that we have in front of us is to authorize the city to hire one full-time non-sworn fire department inspector. Uh, if there's no other discussion, uh, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. If there's any opposed, all right, motion passed, thank you. And we have item F, uh, authorization to fill firefighter upcoming uh, vacancy, Chief Shale. Thank you, Your Honor. As you guys see in the notice, Captain Cunningham is retiring. With his retirement, there will be an individual promoted to captain and then a firefighter promoted to lieutenant, thereby creating a vacancy of a firefighter. One shift will be down to eight once Chad leaves. Um, by authorizing to fill this role a few weeks early, what we'll be able to do is avoid some overtime costs of the orientation. Now we have an individual that is pretty close. He has a final medical exam. Upon com successfully completing the medical exam, exam, he'll be brought to a police and fire commission meeting where he uh, would be hired so long as there's a slot available. So what I'm requesting for you guys is to motion to authorize the city to fill the upcoming firefighter vacancy on or after May 15th, 2023. Okay, could I get a motion I'll to that? I'll make that motion, Your Honor. Motion by Alderman Stevens, second by Alderman Fleury. Uh, any questions uh, regarding that motion on the floor? All right, makes good sense. Thank you, Chief. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, motion passed, thank you. And Chief Item G, Fire Department Vacation, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Fire Department uh, uh, Vacation Time, a carryover. Thank you, Your Honor. We have uh, two firefighters that have some vacation time left on the books. The first one is Corey Mitchell, and Firefighter Mitchell received three days upon completion of his first year, which was at the beginning of March. So he received those days. The calendar was already full, so there was no slots available for him to take that time without causing overtime. So I'm requesting that those three days be carried over. And then the second one is Firefighter Thornton. So every quarter or so we do a reconciliation of vacation time, and a clerical error occurred whereas he was asked to take two of his days off of the calendar and then by the time that the error was discovered the calendar was full so he was unable to take those two days off so uh, due to the clerical error, error i am requesting that his two days are carried over so the requested motion is a approval for five vacation days from FY23 <laughs> to carry over to FY24, three of which are Mitchell's and two of which are Thornton's. Okay, thank you, Chief. Could I get a motion to that effect, please? Motion by Alderman Snow, second by Alderman Stevens. Uh, any questions regarding that? Uh, okay. All right, hearing none, all those in favor of the motion uh, on the floor to approve the five vacation days for year 23 to carry over for uh, for year 24. Uh, please answer yes. Aye. Aye. If there's any opposed. Okay. Motion passed, thank you. And I assume, Chief, that probably we won't have any issues going forward with clerical errors, probably. I can't promise anything. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. We'll, we'll try and do better. Thank you. <laughs> yep. 
All right. Uh, item H, uh, Fire Department, the Apollo Response Chief, Chief Shadle. Thank you, Your Honor. As we each fire department update go over calls of the past month, I think that um, this call here deserves some information for for the council to hear. I know oftentimes you guys get asked, well, what about this, this, and this? And sometimes you guys might feel like you're not the first to know good information. So I just wanted to get some information to you, the council members, on this incident. And the first thing I, I would say is obviously that this is a tragedy, uh, a father, a brother, you know, uh, one individual lost his life. Um, 48 people were treated in the hospital. Um, a lot of those people have a long road ahead of them. They had some, some major injuries, so I'm, I'm not taking away from that, but what I am going to talk about is the response and overwhelmingly a lot of things did go really well as far as the response. So I didn't want to take away from the seriousness of the incident. The other thing is last Tuesday I received confirmation that all persons were treated and released from the hospital, which was very, very good news. We were following up um, every couple days on that. Uh, initially, there were, you know, five, five people in critical care, you know, in the intensive care unit. And there, originally there was two that were not supposed to make it through the night. So because of the excellent care of the doctors and the surgeons and the care teams, they, they did. They did. And then they not only made it through the night, but um, they're released from the hospital. So that's a great update that I wanted to give you guys that. So the call itself came in at 748, and the incident type was a structural collapse due to a direct hit from a tornado. It was right directly in the path. As I said, it caused 48 injuries severe enough to warrant hospital care, and those individuals were treated in five hospitals. There were 27 agencies involved in the response and 26 patients transported by EMS services that night. Basically what I provided for you guys is some color photos from the incident. Some of those are from uh, the Belvedere Police Department and uh, or Boone County Sheriff's drone footage of the building. You can see the extent of the damage and exactly where the damage was located. Uh, that first chart that is actually a hand, uh, written chart shows the agencies involved and, and what they responded to, what they responded with to the incident. On the next chart, you guys can see the actual EMS transports and the hospital's designations. You can see that Cape and Rescue transported five patients, Cherry Valley Fire Department transported three, Harlem Roscoe transported one, Lifeline Elite transported eight, Loves Park Fire transported two, North Boone District Three Ambulance transported five, and North Park Fire Department transported two patients. That next graph, you'll see that eight of those patients went to Mercy. Three red patients, four yellow, and one green. So a red patient, just in general, if you guys don't do triage all the time, a red patient is somebody that is an immediate threat of loss of life. So those are your, your priority patients. So there's when you triage someone and basically they, they're in decompensated shock, like their body is failing to keep them alive, that's what you look for quickly. And then you identify those patients as fast as you can, prioritize, and then those red ones are the ones you want to get to a level one center. You want those reds to be the first ones out, and that is what happened that night. 
you'll see St. Anthony, which is our closest level one center, had eight red patients transported there and four yellow, uh, yellow patients for a total of 12. Swedish American Rockford had five yellow patients and Swedish American Belvedere had one green patient transported for a total of 26 patients. One particular thing about that event is setting up the EMS branch really early helped in this situation and not only was it set up early but those in charge of it which were two district two firefighters um, they quickly handled all the information and then divided up the patients and told them okay this patient send to this hospital this patient send to this hospital so one of the great causes of that success was not sending all the patients to a random hospital. So we learned a lot at the Jackson Street Fire in 2017. We had, I think, 13 or 15 transports. And it happened very differently back then. Back then, everybody just got in the ambulance and they just went and patients that went to Swedish American Belvedere probably should have went to OSF and or all the patients went to one place. We learned a lot and we've been training a lot on how to best handle these mass casualty incidents. So the fire and police have really because of the nature of society been working with mass casualty in incidents and uh, usually active shooter. But um, that triage is the same no matter what the cause of the mass casualty incident. So that's something I know both of our departments have been uh, really working on since 2017 when we identified through an after action report hey we could probably do this better so in this situation you'll see that most of the reds went to a level one and you also notice that the patients were pretty evenly distributed one of the first phone calls that night the very first thing you do in the ems branch is you find out which hospitals can take one level of patients and i overheard the first call was St. Anthony's and they said they can take eight reds and at that time we had five red patients so I, was, I knew we were, we were going to be okay um, with that and so that's how, how that transpired that night. If you look at that last, um, looks like a tree diagram, one second. So that tree diagram basically shows the different, what's called branches of the instant command system. So the instant command system is actually defined nationally through NIMS. Um, if you guys remember the last class you guys had sent me to, and I appreciate it, it was command and control of natural and man-made disasters. So that, that class I attended on, in August in Maryland, and it talked about creating branches, divisions, and groups for large incidents. Um, this is something that also the other officers have been exposed to over time a lot because of the 2017 Jackson Street fire. We said, well, we're going to learn how to do this. And we're going to make sure all our officers know how to do that. And we did. So that, that night there was the search and rescue branch that uh, Dan Drawl oversaw, which was the main operation. And then there was the medical branch. Uh, that I just discussed, and then the TRT branch, which did the secondary searches of all the buildings, also tried to help see if the buildings were safe to be occupied or get some status updates for that. And then another branch that was created that I didn't know until afterwards, so, but it was kind of like the angel branch. I know that's not the right word, but listen to what they did. So. Uh, as we were overwhelmed, District 2 has a lot of firefighters, and they have a lot of chiefs and a lot of officers. Well, a big group of them had stayed at the station and said, you know, we're going to kind of be the protectors of the county. Now, as part of our box cards, we do have Marengo comes to backfill our stations with a engine, uh, a paramedic engine, to run calls while we're obligated to a scene. And then we had Genoa Kingston there as well with an engine and an ambulance providing that but during the scene we had 
a major gas leak at Chrysler. So the tornado had ripped air conditioner units off the roof of the Synchreon building and it was spewing natural gas. We had two separate elevator rescues. We had a gas leak investigation. We had uh, an automatic fire alarm. And then we also had uh, tr multiple trees down on Parkside Manor. So all of those calls were all taken care of and I just heard them getting re responded to with appropriate amounts of resources and I was, I was thankful of that that night. And so what I had found out is that they were supplementing all those responses and with, uh, with appropriate vehicles, chiefs, and everything to make sure that everything got, got met. There was also a, a bad car accident in District 3 and that was one of the first calls they went to. Um, the call came in and they were there and no one was responding, no one was responding. And they said, well, we're gonna respond, we're gonna take care of it. So all in all, we had really good people in really good places and when we look at the next, next slide, the number one thing that I put down was uh, reasons why it was successful is the relationships. Through auto aid agreements and Mavis agreements, we've we've worked with all these guys, um, especially the other Boone County agencies. We meet on a frequent basis and and talk to them, and that we I know them, they know me, and and we help each other out. And that was extremely evident that night. Also, you know, like having the medical branch run by uh, District Two, I I knew those individuals, I knew that they could handle that. Um, I asked Chief Kuntz, he said, what do you need? When he got there, I said, we need a medical branch. And he says, these two guys. And I'm like, yep, and I, I knew they could do it because I, I knew them. Um, Dan and our guys were all inside, all hands on deck. Um, at least 10 people were pulled from rubble. So at, um, at least 10 people needed uh, rescue. And again, it was our guys and the police department and 20 bystanders all, all in that building um, with risks of, I mean, the storm had just happened, risks of loose brick or loose debris in there. there were, all those people were really risking their lives to help others, which is the greatest example of um, how people should be. And so all in all, there was four branches operating on six separate radio channels that night. Um, Dan was managing two, I had three of them, and then, you know, as I said, District 2 actually requested that all their operations be done on Fire 2. So it was because they didn't want to uh, slow anything or have too much uh, communication going on on our, our systems there. So it was a well-coordinated effort because the right people in the right places, um, one other significant factor in the success was MD-1 coming to that incident. MD-1 is a emergency doctor and the MD-1 is provided by Mercy. It's, it's two emergency physicians and they're always on call so they take turns and they're an asset for this whole area for no, no cost. And you call them and you have an emergency doctor on your scene. He ran the triage that night. He oversaw that whole big group of people and made sure that the most critical patients got to where they needed to be. And then, even going before that, you guys will see on that chart of why it was successful, uh, preparation and notification. So all of the hospitals, since there, there was a bad incident a while ago, and they said, let's have an MCI plan, and we all work together. And so relationships, again, so they all work together. They actually put the hospitals on standby when they got the tornado warning, which means that they called extra surgeons, they called extra nurses, and then put them on standby. They took um, not critical patients and cleared out the trauma rooms so that they could handle a large influx. And then when they got notified that we had a mass casualty, they just did everything that they practiced. And that is another huge reason those, those doctors and surgeons and nurses that came in from home that night or drove in, um, probably left their basement 
to, to drive in that night to provide surgery for, for all those people. That was definitely uh, a critical factor to the well-being of all the people that were injured that night. And then I'll, I'll conclude briefly. I did already uh, touch on this, but the preparations this, this year in January, um, our, our department members, you know, they train two hours in a four-hour window every single day. So twice this year already we've trained on triage and mass casualty. We had a active shooter MCI class, and then we had a rescue task force, which is more related to active shooter, but anytime we talk about those, we talk about triage. So already twice this year, we had practiced triage. Uh, so the last thing I have there is skilled responders. You know, this, we're very, very blessed in this entire county, in this entire area, to have skilled responders. And um, that night was a tragedy. The response was overwhelmingly good and uh, plentiful and everybody did what they were trained to do and so I just wanted to make sure you guys as council were aware of everything that happened that night and so I'll be happy to answer any questions but that concludes my update on the Apollo. Okay. Um, any questions for Chief um, Shadle? All right, well I have to say Chief that uh, I was down there uh, early that evening, I, I did receive a call from uh, um, Chief Woody and uh, had went down there. And I will tell you that uh, it was what appeared to be, and it was a chaotic situation, quickly uh, became an organized rescue, um, you know, a treat to be able to rescue, to treat, to triage, and then to transport. And I witnessed that, and I couldn't be um, more proud of uh, our both departments, our EMS responders, uh, police uh, department uh, responded rapidly, and of course, um, our fire department. And uh, I think you might sell yourself a little bit short. Nobody likes to be their own cheerleader, but uh, I will tell you that also that you know the way that you had that organized and everything uh, from having triage at the uh, at the station one uh, taking patients in and having making sure that patients were directed uh, with their injuries making sure that the hospitals could receive them uh, working with uh, dr. Smetana uh, regarding I quite frankly I was amazed that you could find all the time to be so many places at once. And I was just kind of standing there on my crutches watching you go here and there. And, and it was uh, very, very impressive. I couldn't be, um, I couldn't be prouder. And uh, I think the community uh, also had, had seen how this chaotic, uh, you know, disaster, um, in spite of the fact that uh, it was tragic. You're right, we lost one individual. Um, and, uh, but I will guarantee you that uh, without the response that we had, it would have been much, much, it could have been much, much worse. Uh, so I think uh, if you would uh, commend all your uh, troops, uh, Chief Woody as well, um, and District 2 uh, as well. I know District 2, you had mentioned how much good help you had, uh, and we did have, uh, a lot of good help, and uh, certainly what situation could have been a lot worse was prevented. So thank you very much. I appreciate it, both of you, Chief Woody, Chief Shadle, and rank and file, and uh, on behalf of the city of Belvedere, uh, we're fortunate. Uh, we really are, because uh, this one could have went uh, the other way, and uh, from the very start, it was organized and professional, and the response was planned and uh, what you, you had mentioned, what you had trained for, and I was so impressed, so thank you. All right, uh, we have item I, Special Olympics uh, Athlete uh, Parade Request, and that is in your packet. Um, 
And I guess um, it's self-explanatory. Um, Director Jen Jackie is here from the Belvedere Township Park District. She could probably field any questions uh, if she has to, but if I could get a motion uh, on the floor, the event is gonna be Monday, May 22nd. Uh, the hours, as the uh, informational states, uh, will start at 5.30 and at 6 p.m. 5.30 p.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, the route will kick off at Pacemaker Parking Lot, travel down Pearl Street, make a right on First uh, Avenue, and drop off participants at the community building. Uh, so they're asking for uh, approval of this parade permit. Could I get a motion to that effect, please? I'll make that motion, Your Honor. Motion by Alderman Stevens, second by Alderman McGee. Uh, any questions uh, for anybody? this evening. I appreciate uh, Director Jackie coming down here. Um, I don't see any questions. Um, it's a great uh, event, so thank you very much. Uh, hearing no questions, all those in favor of the motion then uh, to approve the parade for May 22nd, uh, Monday, May 22nd from 5.30 to 6 p.m. for the Special Olympic Olympics Athlete Parade, um, please say aye. 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 If there's any opposed, motion passed, thank you. And we also have then item J, a block party request for Cloverdale Way. Um, and as in the informational in front of you, on your desk, uh, in your packet, uh, that is for Sunday, May 28th. Uh, 2 p.m. to 10 p.m. Uh, and uh, there'll be music, bags, volleyball, soccer, bouncy house. Um, sounds like a pretty good time. Could I get a motion to approve that, please? Motion by Alderman Snow, second by Alderman Stevens. Uh, any questions, any concerns regarding that motion? Okay, hearing none, all those in favor, uh, please say aye. 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 If there's any opposed? Okay. Motion passed. Thank you. And then we have item K, block party request at 407 East 4th Street. Uh, that will be on uh, um, 610 of 23 from noon to 8 p.m. Uh, that's for um, a first birthday party. Uh, they're asking for the street to be blocked between Caswell and Fremont. Um, could I get a motion to that effect, please? Motion by Alderman McGee, second by Alderman Stevens. Any questions or concerns regarding that request form the motion on the floor? Okay, hearing none. All those in favor of that motion, uh, please say aye. 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 If there's any opposed? Okay, motion passed, thank you. And item <clears throat> item three, finance and personnel unfinished business, we have none. Item four, finance and personnel new business. Uh, under A, finance department update, uh, Ms. Hansen. Thank you, Mayor. I do have a few updates to share. Last fall, the IRS conducted an audit of the city's 2020 employment tax returns. I'm pleased to report we've received, we have received verbal and now written confirmation, no changes are necessary and the um, examination is now complete. Next item, we are in the process of gathering and providing information to both Sikich and Lauterbach as part of the fiscal year 23 audits. Sikich will be on site May 10th and 11th to begin their preliminary field work and will return for two weeks in June. And then my final update, um, time will be spent this week preparing the city's ARPA annual report, which must be submitted by April 30th. As you'll recall, council approved the use of ARPA funds as part of the first distribution received in fiscal year 22. Those projects are 600,000 for the Southwest Tower Rehabilitation, 700,000 for engineering fees and initial construction costs for the primary clarifier upgrades, and about 245,000 towards the purchase of the fire engine. A portion of these funds came back in the form of proceeds from the sale of the mini pumper last fall. The remaining balance of the first ARPA payment remains unused, and the second payment received this fiscal year has been deposited into a short-term CD 
and also remains available for city projects and operating needs. Okay, thank you, Ms. Hansen. Any questions for Finance Director Hansen? <clears throat> All right, I appreciate your hard work. Thank you. Uh, item five, <clears throat> under other, we have item A, uh, Public Works, uh, Farmington Ponds 2023 Maintenance Agreement, uh, Director Anderson. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, memo in your packet, uh, 2023 maintenance for our Farmington Ponds. Uh, the estimate for this year is 16000 which was the same estimate as was last year. Uh, cost for that last year, as you can see today, is 15243 so they're pretty close to the original estimate. Therefore, I would recommend entering an agreement with Lakeland Biologists for the 2023 Farmington Ponds Maintenance Program at an estimated cost of 16000 This work will be paid for from the Farmington Ponds Special Service Areas, and the budget for this work is $22,700. Okay, motion by Alderman Snow, second by Alderman Stevens. Uh, any questions regarding uh, that motion? Nice to know something didn't go up. Uh, Alderwoman Freeman. Thank you. So, um, Director Anderson, uh, we have 22,000 budgeted. But this 16,000 is just an estimate. So could we potentially go over budget on this? There's always that potential, correct. And then other, other items, there's electricity that's used for the aeration systems out there that's included in that, in that budget. And then also the uh, mowing of those areas is included as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Anderson? All right, hearing none, we have a motion then on the floor, uh, entering an agreement with Lakeland Biologist 2023 for the 2023 Farmington Ponds Maintenance Program at an estimated cost of 16,000. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passed, thank you. And item B, uh, the General Mills uh, Park Basketball Court bid tabulation, tabulation. Mr. Anderson. Thank you, Your Honor. Again, memo in your packet. Um, in spring of 2022, the city received a grant from General Mills in the amount of $25,000 for improvements at the General Mills Park, and those improvements including the construction of a basketball court. Uh, last fall, we, we subgraded the site and, and, and installed the uh, uh, base, stone base, and uh, now we are ready for uh, the asphalt surfacing. We received three bids uh, to complete that work. And I would recommend approval of the low bid from Bell Rock Asphalt Paving in the amount of $9,672.02 for paving of the new basketball court at General Mills Park. And again, this work will be paid for from the $25,000 grant received from General Mills. Okay. Motion by Alderman Porter. Second by Alderman Stevens. Uh, Alderman Snow. Uh, questions, comments? Alderman Snow. So um, will the rest of the money be used to put up the pole and stripe it, things like that? Yep, we have striping of the court to do. We'll have to um, get the basketball hoops and the poles, um, and then depending on the remaining balance will be for further park improvements as well, and we will come back to council uh, for expense of those funds as well. Okay. okay. Alderwoman Freeman. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, my question is for Chief Woody. Um, I know that um, we used to have a skate park behind the Dairy Row Ball and Dottie Park has some issues. Do you have any um, issues, vandalism, anything like that with this park at all? No, nothing that would be uh, something worth mentioning. I mean, we get your uh, typical types of graffitis or you know, uh, neighborhood disputes or, you know, kids fighting, um, but nothing that sticks out that would be uh, consistent problems with this particular park, no. Thank you. Okay. All right. Any other questions uh, regarding the motion on the floor? All right. I would like to uh, recognize General Mills um, for their um, gracious uh, donation contribution for this. Uh, as Brent, uh, Mr. Anderson had said, it would be paid for from a $25,000 grant that they made. So how nice is that? Um, so appreciate it to General Mills. Uh, if there are no other 
questions or comments. All those in favor of the motion, uh, please say aye. Aye. If there's any opposed? Motion passed, thank you. And uh, item C, Public Works uh, Tornado Sirens 2023 Maintenance Agreement with Branoff, Branoff, excuse me, Branoff Communications, Mr. Anderson. Again, in your packet uh, is the proposal from Braniff uh, for this year's maintenance agreement uh, in the amount of $6,030 at $670 per unit. Uh, just as a reference, uh, last year's price was $640 per unit, so that is about a 4.6% increase, but based on what we're seeing for pricing, that's right in the ballpark um, where one would expect that to be. Um, we have $6,800 budgeted. Uh, for the uh, tornado sirens uh, in the current and the upcoming budget. Therefore, I would recommend approval of the uh, proposal from Braniff Communications for the 2023 tornado siren maintenance at a cost of $6,030. Okay, motion by Alderman Stevens, second by Alderman Porter. Uh, any questions regarding the motion on the floor? Alderman Stevens? Hey, Luke, we know they work now because they worked the other night. And we know how important it is that they do work. First right. Tuesday of the month, 10 o'clock. Yep. All right. Uh, if there are no other questions regarding the motion on the floor for Mr. Anderson or anybody else, um, seeing none, hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passed, thank you. And uh, item D, thank you, Mr. Anderson. Uh, item D, planning zoning, comprehensive plan agreement for professional services. House Seal Levine Associates, LLC. Um, I guess uh, I would entertain a motion uh, first regarding that in order to kick off discussion. Uh, motion by Alderman Porter. Second by Alderman Stevens. Uh, Gino, would you like to comment, please? This has been a long, uh, ardu arduous process. Yes, so I will keep a long story short, but feel free to ask questions. Um, staff has been trying to update our comprehensive plan for about five years now. Um, had not been successful in the past um, with the uh, consultant. Um, Basically, you should be updating your comp plan every 10 years. Ours is from 1999, and there was an update in 2006. That update was very progressive, very forward-thinking, nothing wrong with it at that time. Obviously, a lot has happened since 2006, the recession, um, COVID, stuff like that. It's not really a valid plan anymore. Um, and I get phone calls, we are in meetings with developers, and usually the first thing out of their mouth is, well, I know our idea doesn't meet your comp plan, but hopefully you're, you'll hear us out. In which we always say, of course, but how many developers are not even calling us because they're seeing our comp plan and thinking, oh, we won't go against it, it's not worth it. So I think it's really vital to get a functioning comp plan um, out there. Um, some things that I want changed is our current comp plans, like 200 some odd pages. It's intimidating, it's cumbersome. Um, this consultant is looking at doing about 50 pages. You know, there's like 30 different land use c categories in the current comp plan. It's very pigeonholed, where this will be a little bit more vague. That way the developers can come talk to us and we can decide if it's something we want. Um, it won't be so pigeonholed. I did go out for RFPs last year um, so that it would, and it was part of this current year's uh, budget. I went out for RFPs, extended the timeline on their RFPs a little bit. Um, House of Levine submitted uh, a good response. Then Stellantis made their proposal. Obviously that's a huge impact on the growth of our community. So kind of wanted to, to wait a little bit to, till we got a better feel for what is going on with Stellantis and some of the other um, growth options in the area. Um, in the meantime, Shannon 
uh, put half the funding into next year's budget knowing that it wouldn't get completed in time and, and now we're really pushing to get anything in this year's budget I'm trying Shannon um, so basically House of Levine submitted it they are very reputable one thing I liked about them is they um, work a lot with smaller communities that are close to larger communities um, they've worked in Huntley McHenry New Lenox Mokina Shanahan so those are our all mid-sized communities like us along major highways like us, somewhat in the shadow of a larger community like us. So they're very familiar with what Belvedere is. They've also worked in Freeport and Rockford and Marengo. So they're familiar with this area as well. They're just not a suburban consultant. Um, and as far as their traffic proposal aspect of the comp plan, they will be teaming up with Kim Lee Horn, who I worked with them when I interned in Tinley Park a lifetime ago. Um, so Kim Lee Horn is a longstanding traffic consultant with a very good reputation. So I, um, I was, like I said, I was happy with their response. I'm happy with their history and their familiar, familiarity with towns like Belvedere, so we won't get a, a Chicago uh, comp plan, you know, given to us or um, something that belongs even more rural than us. So I would recommend approval to move forward with uh, this proposal. Okay. Motion by Alderman Fleury, second by Alderman McGee. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. It's not even that late yet. Uh, all right. Uh, Questions? Alderman, Alderman Fleury was first. You had your hand up? He's making okay. motion that already made. Okay. Well, look. So. You were the, you were the only one. <laughs> All right. Uh, Alderman Freeman. Thank you. So, Gina, can you talk about what a comp plan consists of? Is it like zoning and land use and what else? Yep. So, comp plans can can vary, but the the bread and butter of a comp plan is your future land use. It is to say this, so it's not just the immediate city limits, it's kind of that mile and a half or however far out we want to extend of our future growth that is um, feasible in the next 10 to 15 years, stating this is where we want our commercial growth, this is where we want our residential growth, this is where we want our residential growth, these are where our new road connections uh, should be um, and then it can also uh, give goals and objectives like your historic preservation could be stronger your traffic corridor could be stronger um, we recommend your zoning code be amended to um, encourage transit oriented development or to encourage um, mixed use development um, it can also be used as a marketing tool um, I know we've discussed in the past with economic development, tourism, all that stuff. We don't really have a marketing tool. And right now, I cannot give a 200-page document <laughs> to anyone to say, here's how great Belvedere is. You should come to us. Where this, um, I've talked to them um, over the phone. There will probably be a couple of pages that are would almost be like detachable that that way we could hand out to people and have at the booth at the fair and stuff like that to use for marketing materials. But yeah, the bread and butter of a comp plan is your future um, zoning and your future road connection. It's also what Brent would use for when he does his um, infrastructure when you're planning your new sewer and your wells. You should have an idea of where your development is going to be so that way you know what kind of well capacity you should have I mean I just I finally read that study you put on my desk like a month ago um, that talked about with the anticipated industrial growth this is what your water usage would be and can your current well handle it so all those studies kind of go back to your comp plan for that data Alderman Snow and what time it what kind of time frame do you anticipate this? Um, about six to nine months. They will they will be coming to Belvedere. It will not all be done through uh, Google Street View and, and Zoom meetings because I am just tired of Zoom meetings. Um, so there will be two joint meetings, um, most likely special meetings with the uh, City Council and Planning Commission. I'm invited so that you guys will be apprised of the situation every you know step of the way, and you'll have feedback. 
there will be a community input, and then there will probably be some meetings with stakeholders while they gather some data. Alderman Porter? So you're saying six to nine months till it's, 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 it's completed? Correct, and then it'll go through a public hearing at Plan Commission and then to City Council for a vote. Um, I know Gina has mentioned uh, her, some frustration. Uh, when I first come into office, uh, I know she had mentioned to me that uh, we needed a comp plan. Obviously, uh, things have changed uh, since the last one we had done, and it's long overdue, but uh, it will be timely as we, um, we continue to see opportunities with uh, new growth and uh, it won't uh, be a 200 page document that pigeonholes us or um, you know f forces us not to be able to entertain uh, what would be good common sense development uh, good for the community um, and uh, in a number for a number of reasons why actually so I'm glad uh, Gina's worked very hard on it and uh, she's done a great job um, so hopefully uh, we'll have this in six to nine months and it'll, we'll, we'll be able to use it as a tool, certainly with uh, any development that uh, is considering coming to our community and it'll be, it'll be long overdue and, and uh, very helpful. So, all right, thank you, Gina. Um, so we need a vote. Uh, all those in favor of the motion on the floor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, motion passed, thank you. And um, item E, um, I had, uh, when I had ran for election, there were some things that I wanted to address um, and I had actually put those in, um, I had put those in as ideas that I had and uh, they still hold true today. Uh, they're not, maybe we've had a lot of uh, busy uh, a lot of other issues that have gotten in the way but I think it's a good time it's almost a two-year half half uh, half midterm point here and I think it's a good time to probably uh, bring this to fruition for a number of reasons or at least bring it up for discussion uh, the solid waste collection so garbage service in the city of Belvedere as everybody's aware we have um, individuals uh, businesses that uh, collect individuals garbage uh, there may be three four five different companies a lot of times they'll cross each other's path as they collect the garbage and I do know uh, that their fees have went up uh, they've went up quite a bit and I hear that I get calls and I get email submissions from individuals that say you know uh, my garbage services went up exponentially and uh, I was wondering if the city would consider um, how we could uh, maybe improve uh, the service uh, less wear and tear on our streets. Um, it doesn't make sense to me, never has made sense, that uh, one truck passes another. And uh, I do know in other communities, uh, they have, uh, you know, created um, an agreement, a contract with providers that give the taxpayers a break, uh, make it uh, less expensive for them. And it, that doesn't even take into consideration when you have to figure about uh, figure up what we pay for um, that over um, the fire, uh, the uh, garbage trucks on the streets just you know they create wear and tear so I thought it was probably a good time to at least kick this off it is preliminary um, we're gonna get some more information to you so I won't have anything tonight but I did want to get it on the agenda it was a promise <clears throat> that um, that I had made and uh, I intend on keeping it and uh, whatever that information bears out the council will have a decision to make in the future uh, whether or not it in fact uh, is worth it and uh, we'll see what that brings us in the near future so anyhow with that being said uh, there's nothing else on the agenda for this evening could I have a motion to adjourn please motion by Alderman McGee uh, second by Alderman Porter thank you uh, all those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Okay, motion passed. Thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. Thank you for your time. For the record, we adjourned at 7 uh, 19 p.m. Thank you.